Hey tea heads, this is Don from Mayleaf. In this video, does aging improve ripe poor tea? In this video, I am going to be tasting a very special 1980s ripe poor to see how aging affects the experience of the tea. If at any point in time you enjoy this video, then make sure you hit it with a like. And if you're not following us on all of our socials, then go click those buttons. It's a very special day for me. It's not often that you get to taste a ripe pua that is over 30 years old. This is new in stock, very small batch, a vintage tea. This is our 1980s sugar nut reserve. This is a very, very special tea that we found this year and I am super excited to share it with you. Let's quickly talk about the difference between ripe pua tea and raw pua tea. So raw pua tea is allowed to age naturally, which is a combination of oxidation and fermentation as the leaves just start to react with the air and the microbes within the leaves start to transform the tea. With the ripening process, what the manufacturers and producers are doing is essentially accelerating that fermentation process. They do this through a sort of composting process where they take the leaves, they pile them up, they make them wet. And you know what? Let me just show you. We're in the fermenting warehouse to make cooked pua tea, shulcha. Nothing's happening now because we're here in springtime. The fermenting process will begin usually around August time. Um, so this is the big warehouse. There's water supplies coming in through the walls. Let's take a look at this floor. This floor is a porous surface and you can see here previous ferment dust and this is valuable stuff because this stuff here contains, is rich in microbes that will be the starter culture for the fermentation process come August with the fresh leaves. But they don't just rely on the microbes that exist and are seeded on this floor. They will also take sheng cha, dust, broken leaf from raw um, sheng cha, raw tea, which naturally contains microbes and they'll spread it on the floor. I'll show you here. We have sacks ready to go. So these are sacks of broken leaf sheng cha. They're not using this to sell. Um, even though it's probably very high quality tea, but this contains a wealth of microbes as well. So what they'll do is they'll actually spread this on the floor first, and then after that, they will put the tea that they're going to ferment down and they'll make large piles with trenches in between, large piles. They'll cover it with about 20% water, and then they'll cover it with um, porous cloth. Every day they'll, they'll come in and they'll check the temperature using these temperature gauges. So what they'll do is they'll stick this into the pile and they wanna make sure that the temperature does not go above 60 degrees Celsius. Clearly that's, the, that's the, the barrier point. When it gets above 60 degrees, probably the cultures and the microbes start to change, the balance starts to change, and you probably start to get unwanted fermentation happening. So making sure that it stays under 60 degrees. If it's over 60 degrees, then what they'll do is they'll um, put trenches in, they'll, they'll uh, move the tea leaves, put some trenches and some airways in between um, the tea leaves to allow temperature to escape, to allow the heat to escape. Every, they'll do this every day, but every week they'll come back and they will uh, move the leaves so the leaves at the bottom will be moved to the top and again they will cover with water and cloth. The fermentation process takes about 45 days to complete. This is the last stage in shu cha cooked pu'a production before they, the tea gets pressed into cakes. This is the resting phase, it's also called tou chan, which basically means that the tea is put into sacks, breathable sacks, and left for three years. During those three years, any unwanted aromas that came from the fermenting phase starts to disappear, and the texture of the tea improves, and it means that you don't have a furry, tingling sensation on your tongue when drinking it. So three years the tea needs to rest before it's pressed into cakes. This is new production, so this has got three years to go. You can see around me the warehouse here. Lots of tea at different stages of this resting phase, and those sacks over there are from 2014, so just over three years they are ready for pressing into cakes. 
And so now you should have a better idea of how this tea is made. And as you can see, it also needs to be stored for a while in order for the uh, undesirable fermentation aromas to dissipate at least a couple of years in general. There are exceptions, but at least a couple of years is a good rule. While this one here has been aging loose for over 30 years. Now bear in mind that this fermentation or wet piling process for Pua tea was only really developed in the 1970s. It was borrowed from other forms of making hecha or fermented ripened tea from other provinces like Guangxi province, which is a traditional method, but it was only really established as a way of ripening pua tea in the 1970s. Now this tea here is from the 1980s. So this is a real heritage tea. This is an origin pua that was created only within about 10 years or so of the first ever ripe pua's being produced. So this is a heritage tea. This is an heirloom tea. That's why I'm super excited. Let's quickly scope this tea, although I don't know that much about it. We'll, we'll just go through what I do know. Season, this comes from the 1980s. We don't know the exact year, and it may be that it's a blend of years, so I'm not quite sure, but at least 30 years old. The cultivar would be the Daejeong cultivar. The origin, again, I am not sure this, is, this was produced in uh, Meng Hai, so it was produced in that famous ripening area of Yunnan province, but I'm not quite sure where these leaves were picked. I think it would be from the surrounding area, so the Bulang mountain areas, but that is just a guess. Picking and processing, as you've seen, it's gonna be a, a picking where you can see the leaves here look slightly larger than your average Gong Ting picking, so I'm gonna say that it was more like a raw pua picking, which is a bud and up to three leaves, I would say. The processing, as you've seen, involves that ripening process and then storing the tea elevation. I don't know, considering that I don't know which mountains it came from, I don't know the elevation. So this is a rare instance where I really can't fill in too many of the gaps regarding the scope. This tea, I discovered it this year um, through um, some farmers that were growing uh, and producing ripe pua. This was from their reserve collection and I managed to buy up a small quantity because I really, really loved it when I first tasted it. Right, let's get on with tasting. I'm gonna put this temperature up to 99 degrees, so we're gonna go as close to boiling as possible. We're gonna brew this hot. Um, let's quickly take a little look at these leaves. So we do eyes dry leaf. You can see here, oop, I dropped one. I will pick that one up, the little straggler. You can see here that the leaves are nice, um, very, I'll go a bit closer, very, very um, interestingly textured leaves. You can see you've got that rough matte texture, which also looks like it's got a little bit of uh, extra texture on, which are related to the fermentation process. So you've got those rough matte leaves. The color is a sort of carob brown, chocolate browns, chestnut browns, very, very nice color. The shape of the leaves are large and you've got clumped up uh, parts there where you can see the microorganisms have developed sort of clumps of leaves, which is very, very desirable for a lot of the ripe pua out there. You may have heard of uh, cha to, which is a tea which um, is a sort of clump that comes from the mycelium and all the microorganisms sort of bonding together to create a clump of leaves, I start to see a little bit of that activity. Not as much, but I start to see a little bit of activity in these leaves. So, really, really nice looking leaves. Really, really excited. I'm gonna pour some warm water now in here while this kettle continues to heat up. And then we are going to give this a smell of those dry leaves. Super excited. Here we go. So 
Very, very rich aroma. I'm getting things like, okay, so I'm getting some of the classic, uh, more earthy notes of a ripe pu'er tea, those cavernous notes, but real um, uh, clay, uh, you know, those um, clay workshops where you go to like an arts and crafts workshop and you've got that, that smell of clay is there. And Chinese herbs are in there as well. I'm getting things like dungwe, angelica, so some of those herbal notes, a little bit of celery sort of spice, spiciness, you know, celery tops, the leaves of, of celery, which are very classic uh, aroma notes for ripe pu'er. It's very rich, it's very deep, but I'm also getting sweetness coming through. I'm getting some milk chocolate. I'm getting some Brazil nuts, so those, those nuts that have an earthier note to them. Brazil nuts, chocolate, just a, a, a definite sweeter element or sweeter note than your average ripe pu'er tea. But from my memory, this tea needs, obviously, it's been sitting for over 30 years, it needs to be rehydrated. It needs to be brought back to the present so we can really experience the aromas of this leaf. So we're at 93 degrees here. I'm just gonna rinse. Take your time, obviously, if you get such a precious tea, but I am conscious of not keeping you guys waiting for too long. Oh. Oh, okay. There are some leather notes coming through. So I'm getting leather, clay workshops, some of those Chinese herbs, the milk chocolate sweetness is coming through again. Um, I'm getting a little bit more fruit coming through as well. What is that fruit? A little bit like um, grape, maybe dried grape, but that's raisins, <laughs> raisins, a little bit, but not the, not, not the tang, more of just a sweet note coming through on it. So I'm getting those carob chocolate notes and um, some leather and um, just a very, very deep, rich, clean, no funkiness, no muskiness, considering this has been sitting for so many uh, years. That's quite remarkable. I'm going straight from the guy one into a cup. It's solo drinking time for me today. The color of the liquor is a nice chestnut red brown liquor color. It's getting that, that film, that mist developing on the top. This is a magical, magical tea. Oh. So clean tasting with all of that complexity. The texture is soft. The texture, you can get some mineral dryness after you've swallowed, but in the mouth, the um, immediate texture is very soft, very sweet water texture. It's got, I would say, a medium thickness to it. Bear in mind, this is just the first infusion, so you know, and a very short infusion. These leaves are gonna take a while to open up. They have this sort of matte clumped up feel. And even if you push them now, I mean, if I close my eyes, that feels almost like dry leaf. It's gonna take a while for these uh, tea leaves to hydrate. Initial flavor profiles, I'm getting a lot more sweetness. Very much that sort of buried sweetness, sugary sweetness, almost like a meringue sweetness to it. Um, but I'm also getting nuts, and those nuts um, have moved from the Brazil nuts to, um, I would say, hazelnuts, chestnuts, or even peanuts. I'm also getting some peanuts, like um, peanut brittle, when you've got those peanuts that are embedded in those, that hard caramel, and you get that, that uh, sugary um, nut which is why we call it Sugar Nut Reserve. So I'm getting all of those things, uh, meringues, uh, hazelnuts, maybe some pistachio nuts, I'm getting chestnuts, I'm getting uh, peanuts. 
I'm still getting those Chinese herbal notes. I'm still getting the clay and earthy notes. So I don't want you to just think it's just sugary nuts, but definitely that is there. The sugariness is a sort of simple, sweet, syrupy sugariness. It's almost like a nougat. You know how those white nougats have those egg whites, which is again, meringue. So those egg whites, chewy egg whites, uh, sweet egg whites, and um, usually I think pistachios and hazelnuts. It's very much a nougat taste to it. And then the combination of that complexity that comes from the herbal note to it, the spice in it, but very clean again, no fishiness, no mustiness, absolutely none of that. This is pure, clean, ripe, pure. This is just the first infusion. Oh, and it's so, so, it's in a way, what's so beautiful about it is all of the flavor notes that you look for in a ripe pour are there, very clean, very pure, very focused and expanded, just a little bit more complex. So my initial um, feeling is that the aging process not just makes the, the flavor more clean and clear and focused, but it also uh, amplifies and concentrates the flavor and adds some complexity, but not a huge amount. Certainly nothing in the same region as with raw pua, because with raw pua, that natural aging process boosts up the complexity of the flavor. Um, with ripe puas, the aging process, I think, just clarifies the flavor and amplifies the flavor rather than adding too much more complexity. Second infusion, and then we're gonna talk about the finish, and then I'm going to show you, or I'm going to try to figure out how many infusions I can get out of these leaves because supposedly I'm being told that with these aged ripes, these really vintage, vintage heirloom aged ripes, you can get many, many more infusions than you could out of a younger ripe pua. The color has now become darker. Now I'm getting really deep chestnut brown color. Texture has thickened up. It's still very soft. It's very supple. It's very thick. It's very sweet. I'm getting those nuts, hazelnuts, um, pralines, just sugared nuts. Uh, nougat, I'm getting a little bit of leather, I'm getting a little bit of antique wood, I'm getting um, a lot of that art, ceramics, studio, clay aroma, and the Chinese herbal note is there, but it's really, really balanced, very, very clean and clear. Finish, nicely dry, dry all over the mouth, but nothing, nothing uh, catching or unpleasant moving to a juiciness, and that juiciness is very sweet. Probably one of the most sweet finishes of any ripe pu'er tea that I've ever tasted before. Very, very sweet, very, very nice and dry to juicy. Okay, so this was the second infusion. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pull out a load of bowls, and I'm just gonna brew as many infusions as I can to see at what point the infusions die out and there's no point going any further. Let's see how many infusions we can get out of these leaves. Okay, here we go. So this is the third infusion up to the 14th infusion. I have been sipping a little bit while I've been brewing. It's amazing how the persistence of flavor is running through. I haven't tasted these ones yet, so I'm gonna go straight to the end, number 14. So the decision, needs to, the decision needs to be made as to whether or not it's reached the end of its course. And I can tell you right now, that has not reached the end of this co its course at all. If you give, gave me this infusion, I would think that would be your like sixth or seventh maybe infusion of a ripe pu'er tea. It's still got lots and lots of clarity of flavor. I'm still getting those nuts. I'm still getting the sweetness, very, very sweet. 
almost berry sweetness, like a jujube red date sweetness to it as well. Um, so what I did is I just, I added about three seconds for each infusion. So this one worked out to be something in the region of about 40 to 50 seconds, 45 seconds I think that one was. So I just adding three seconds. The difference in color, you can see it, but it's not that noticeable. So if I go from the third to the 14th, it's a little bit lighter for sure, of course. I would say this is actually more sweet and that brings out more of the herbal notes. It seems like as you move through the infusions, you're, you're accentuating the sweetness by reducing some of those more herbal spicy notes. Really, really lovely. The consistency of flavor continues though. It's very, very consistent. Just the herbal note being taken down to reveal more of the sweetness. You know what? I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna see if we can get past 20 with this. I'll be right back. All right, here we are. That's 14 up until 26 infusion. For those of you worrying, don't worry. I have not wasted this precious tea. I've taken all these infusions, put them into a brew rider. So I'm gonna have plenty of this incredible tea for the rest of the evening. So let's quickly taste um, the last couple and see at what point I would have stopped brewing. So I'm gonna show you the color here of the liquor. You can see the color of the liquor is still Got some color to it. This is the 26th infusion here. Let's give it a taste. I mean, I'm telling you, it still has this nutty, sweet water um, taste to it. Definitely still got flavor. You could probably still keep going with this tea. It's very much sweet water, a little bit, of those herbal notes, tiny bit, a little bit of red, um, sorry, a little bit of red jujube sweetness, very, very slightly, and definitely nuttiness still going on there. I would say probably it's still drinkable, it's still enjoyable, um, but probably I would, that's obviously stronger flavor, I would say somewhere in this region. So that's about 23 infusions before I would say, okay, I'm done. You could keep going. If you look at these leaves themselves, you can see that the leaves themselves still, still haven't opened up properly. They still feel kind of dry and crunchy to the fingers. Um, so definitely more extraction could be uh, gotten out of these leaves. You could definitely boil this up. In fact, I'm probably going to do that afterwards. Boil it up and just really get, get, get it on a very, very rolling boil for a good 10, 15 minutes just to extract everything out of these leaves. But the conclusion here is that aging right poor tea does a few things. The first thing it does is it obviously dissipates any of that mustiness and that cooked uh, ripening fermentation aroma that happens. And that is the first couple of years of aging to dissipate all of that mustiness that you don't want in your ripe poor flavor. After that, further aging seems to clarify Again, just removing any other residual flavors or residual aromas and just clarify the essence of the aromas in the tea. So clarify, concentrate as well. I think it does amplify and concentrate the aroma and the flavor. And definitely uh, the taste becomes more on the sweeter side. My mouth right now is full of this sweet nougat um, taste. Very, very, very sweet. Almost reminds me of a raw pua in that very, very sweet lingering aftertaste. The aftertaste is epic, really, really long. Um, so it develops more sweetness. And finally, as you can see here, it really does allow you to brew so many more infusions. I'm definitely gonna boil up those leaves and I'll throw a picture in so that you can see the color of the liquor after I've boiled those leaves. Smell of the empty cup. Straight up hazelnuts. 
and sweet chocolate, milk chocolate, milk chocolate and hazelnuts. Oh, really, really lovely. And also, the body sensation of this tea is different to your average ripe pu'er, and I'm not sure if that is related to the aging process. Of course, ripe pu'ers have this digestive settling quality, but there's a certain kind of euphoric feeling, not like a ripe, not like a raw pu'er, sorry, but that slight euphoric feeling that comes, I would say, you know, if you've just done a yoga session or if you've gone to the gym and you're feeling settled, you're feeling calm, but slightly euphoric, a little bit lightheaded and a little bit euphoric that comes from that exercise. It's that kind of feeling that I'm getting here. As I said, I'm not sure if it's to do with the age or if it is just the tea itself, but definitely a really, really nice body sensation on this tea as well. I highly recommend if you're interested to taste a tea, a ripe tea, which harks back to the dawn of producing these ripe teas over 30 years old. This is a 1980s sugar nut reserve. Really, really recommend it. Definitely one to experience. A great, great tea. Pick it up if you are interested. That's it, tea heads. If you made it to the end of this video, then make sure you hit it with a like. Follow us on all of our socials so that you don't miss out on any news and videos from Mayleaf HQ. If you're ever in London, then come visit us in Camden to say hi and taste our wares. If you have any questions or comments, then please fire them over. Other than that, I'm Don from Mayleaf. Thank you for being a part of the revelation of true tea. Stay away from those tea bags. Keep drinking the good stuff and spread the word because nobody deserves bad tea. Bye.